Welcome to Syndicated Nightmares, where each week we take a deep dive into an episode of Freddy's Nightmares based on the Nightmare on Elm Street film series. This week, hosts Dave and Michelle are joined by Tommy Hudson and Peter Brackey to talk about Season 2, Episode 22, Life Sentence, directed by Anita W. Addison, written by David Zuckerman, and original air date, March 11th, 1990. And we're super excited to be here. Yeah, welcome for having us. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, yeah. I'm Peter Brackey, so I'm actually the author of Crystal Lake Memories, The Complete History of Friday the 13th. So I guess I'm uh, I'm the Jason guy um, a little bit on that end. But of course, you know, with Freddy versus Jason, um, Jason, you know, I was always around the orbit of Nightmare on Elm Street. I grew up on those films and loved them just as much as I loved, you know, Halloween and Friday the 13th. So I'm definitely a child of the, of the 80s, of 80s and- slasher films. And this is Tommy Hudson. I wrote and produced the documentary Never Sleep Again, The Elm Street Legacy. I also wrote the book on the making of Wes Craven's original Elm Street. So I've kind of been entrenched in the Elm Street universe for quite a while and was definitely a fan growing up. Uh, Craven's original film really got me jazzed to be in the movie business. So I definitely have, I think, a longstanding history in terms of my you know, love and admiration and fascination with Freddie and the franchise. Excellent. And yeah, of course. So the plot summary on Wikipedia is in this follow up to prisoner of love. Andy Caulfield is a prisoner who is about to get parole until he's faced with a prison counselor who also happens to be a relative of one of his victims. The second half open uh, second half centers on Warden Hendler, who is using prisoners as guinea pigs to test a new drug for extracting vital information until the experiment backfires with drastic results. It's not really a follow up, though, except it's the same. Warden. Yeah, in, in the same prison. <laughs> and that's about it. It's interesting, too. It's an interesting synopsis, because if you were to read that without Freddy's nightmares as any kind of backdrop, it would not sound like a horror show in any way, shape or form. Yeah. It just sounds like kind of a police procedural sort of drama, which I, I think this episode, particularly maybe in the scheme of all of Freddy's nightmares to me is a little interesting that way. Also it's interesting because, you know, Freddy pops in a couple of times, but one of the things with the show in general is if you remove the Freddy bookends, it could be any anthology show as well. You could have the Crypt Keeper introduce this episode and it probably wouldn't make a difference or Tales from the Dark Side or something like that. It has more of an interchangeable yeah, feel. Yeah, with these standalone episodes, you're absolutely right on that. Some of the episodes are Freddy-centric and they go into his backstory, but for an episode like this, you're you're totally right. Oh, there's a couple of dreams. I mean, they do always throw the dream imagery now i guess that's the one thing that does connect it to freddy a bit like there's the bit in this one when um the warden gets electrocuted in the chair that that whole dream sequence kind of thing so it seems like there's always at least one dream sequence that's somewhat connected to the nightmare for this universe. episode we start off with an armored truck guard um, gets knocked out outside of springwood savings and loan there's two men we later find out their names are Bruno and Andy. They are robbers without a mask, and they are hijacking an armored truck, like the the truck that has all the billions of dollars from a bank. Their plan is to hijack the, the truck, and um, there's a guard inside the truck who gets shot, and Bruno says to Andy, like, that's going to get you caught. And Andy's like, I'm not going to get caught. And then we fast forward to seven years later and we see that Andy did get caught and he's in Springwood prison right now. I, I, one of the things I loved about this episode was, I think, knocking over the Springwood bank seemed pretty <laughs> yes. easy. I mean, the guy, <laughs> was, he, the guy he was hiding in the bushes. <laughs> Gosh, I didn't know it was that big. And I also guess I didn't realize how, you know, you keep thinking about all the things that have been layered on and piled on and added to the mythology of Springwood and Now it has a prison, you know, it just becomes this town that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Springwood has become its own like community deserted island somewhere that just has everything that you could possibly need. No one ever has to leave. Yeah. Yeah, Most small towns don't have prisons. Yeah. I could be wrong. (laughs) (laughs) So in our in our fast forward of seven years, we meet uh, Alamo and she is Springwood prison psychiatrist who is going to be meeting with the inmates who are up for parole. And that just happens to be Andy. Um, 
we learned that he only had to serve seven years because he made a plea. And uh, so instead of having to serve life for committing murder, he just had to serve seven years and now he's up for parole. And she doesn't want him out. We don't yet know, mm-hmm. I think, the mm-hmm. reason that she seems adamant about him, but she doesn't want and him And then to we cut to um, Freddie. He gives his little quip of um, coming out of the Elm Street house. Oh, yeah. And he, he says he went to his favorite banks and goes, what, what did he do? The blood bank. And he went <laughs> to um, the sperm <laughs> bank. And I think he went to one more. I can't remember exactly what it was. Organ bank. The organ bank. The, the blood bank, <laughs> eyeball bank, organ bank, and sperm bank. <laughs> and for the, for the sperm bank, he, he said that he, there was a slip of paper for the sperm bank. And it said, substantial penalty for early withdrawal so that was oh, his, his little joke yeah. <laughs> yeah. i love this actress who who plays the psychiatrist mm-hmm. because she was on the first three seasons of 24 <laughs> and she's yeah. fantastic i just yeah, love she's her actually done this, a lot yeah. of work yeah. she's done a mm-hmm. bunch of work mm-hmm. but yeah so the next scene so andy needs the shrink's approval um, before he can get parole, and there's another prisoner calling him Ratman. And this other prisoner I recognized from Breaking Bad. Uh, mm-hmm. It was on the first couple seasons. But yeah, she's Dr. Alamo is talking to them, and the, the the guy from Breaking Bad is talking about being born again and all repentant. And Andy is just, you know, happy that he, you know, is getting off and he is unrepentant and he plea bargained because he turned over his partner and that's why he's yeah and during their meeting they're talking about the likelihood of andy's recidivism and if he has learned his lesson and if he's remorseful and all that andy is acting like he is but alamo doesn't think that he is so she goes to the warden and uh basically says like i don't think that he's ready to be released he should be in for a little bit longer the warden was a bit defensive up until now, nothing about this sounds like anything going on in the Nightmare Elm <laughs> yes. universe. Yes. <laughs> or like the Freddy universe other than Freddy popping up. And that's why I, I really find this episode of this show very interesting. I know a lot of them tended to be like that. But even when they weren't Freddy-centric, I felt like the nightmares felt a little more horrific, perhaps. I, this is an interesting episode of the show. I- it's also interesting because Freddy himself, you know, his brand of humor is very un-PC, um, you know, like a joke, sperm bank, things like that. So tonally, even more so, I think this episode doesn't really feel like it's part of the universe either. Because at least some of the other episodes, either dark or goofy with a monster or something, this is kind of a, I would say, super serious. But it's a pretty straightforward, serious themes going on. So, it, it, it again, it feels kind of like a mishmash mm-hmm. tonally from the rest of Freddy's Nightmares At this Nightmares point, to me. with Alamo putting her concern out there that... Um, Andy isn't remorseful. The warden tells her to petition the parole board because basically his hands are tied. That was the plea deal and that's that. So he he leaves the room and she then goes ahead and calls the warden of the prison that Bruno is being held in. And she's basically making sure that Bruno's transfer to come to Springwood prison where Andy is, is still a go. And uh, I, I guess he's, he's on his way. And Alamo we learn has some hidden motives with her interest in Andy. Oh, the drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, as you recap it, I forgot how, how very plotty it is. There's a lot of plot going on. That's what I mean. There's a lot yeah. of drama going on in this lots episode. Of, lots of backstory. And... So then we, we find out why she, why Dr. Alamo has this vendetta, because her father was the armed guard who was shot, and she was 18 years old at the time and swore to get her revenge. Uh, and I was trying to figure out, like, is seven years a realistic timeline for going from zero to <laughs> <Is it enough>? <laughs> present psychiatrist? <laughs> In Springwood, like, it yeah. is. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. We were looking for connections, although there's more time. You know what? I mean, we were looking for connections. One could really make a leap that, you know, terrible events, you know, occurred in her life, which prompted her to try to make the world a better place and become a psychiatrist. Terrible events occurred in Nancy Thompson's <laughs> life. And <laughs> yeah. Dream Warriors, she wanted to make the world a better place and became 
I guess, you know, like on her way to being a psych esque type intern. Yeah. I mean, yeah, she was sort How of the I intern. To be in college to be a dream psychologist. Is that even a thing? <laughs> I don't know. Do you need a med? Like, that's what I mean. I'm not really sure exactly what. Uh, do we ever really know, like, does she have a PhD? Is she working toward her PhD or did she just go for like psych in for her bachelor's? Yeah. I don't know. Well, what maybe one she's, needs. Taking, she's taking extension courses at Springwood University. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she went to the learning. Yeah. Guys. yeah. <laughs> it's possible when she was a senior in high school that she took college credit courses. So that kind of expedited what all the classes that she would have to take, at least her her general ed classes for college. I think yeah. we should just rewrite Nancy's story because that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah. with her. Right. Let her, she, you know, she took AP uh-huh. classes and she probably did though. I mean, Nancy is yeah, pretty smart. That's true. Well, now I, I kind of want to know, did Nancy have to take out financial loans for college or did she get a, a full ride? There are so many things. <laughs> oh, I'm sure she got, yeah. I'm sure she got a scholarship. <laughs> Well, how did she Nancy explain her culture. mother being dead and all her friends being dead? I mean, she would be able to write one killer That's essay. True. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Name one <laughs> obstacle in your life yeah. that you defeated. <laughs> and how you... <laughs> And how you <laughs> yeah. So for, for this episode, we also find out with, um, in my notes, I noted him as Tuco because that's his character in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. So Tuco and, and Andy, they're like cell neighbors. Their cells are right next to each other. And Andy is telling him about the money that he stole from the bank that he hid it somewhere. And when he's released, he'll be able to get the money. And um, that's when we find out more about Alamo's story and, and her dad. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that, like Peter said, there's a lot of plot going on mm-hmm. in this episode. And, you know, even up until that point, there's not a lot of, you know, quote unquote, horror really mm-hmm. going on, which I think is interesting. But there really is no horror in the whole, uh, very little in the whole episode, really. Yeah. And then we he's well, then we get a, a dream sequence because he's heading out in a Andy is heading out in a top hat and tux and the, the warden opens the door. I think he thinks he's being released. But then he's going right into the electric chair and and Dr. Mm-hmm. Alamo is right there, you know, celebrating and pulling the, the switch and he gets electrocuted and it was a nightmare. Which I think that, you know, was interesting. It works. I actually, I will admit, I thought the tuxedo thing was interesting for a moment because I thought, mm. did he come in with a tuxedo? <laughs> Maybe that's the only clothes <laughs> he had. Oh, no, we're in a nightmare. Yeah. I kind of thought that was interesting. Of course, my mind immediately went to shock mm-hmm. as soon as I saw the yeah. electric chair. And I just thought it was just, yeah, it was just interesting yeah. to me that that was the nightmare that they chose yeah. to do. And I thought, are they really executing people at Springwood yeah. Prison? <laughs> that quickly. When I, when I worked at a jail, uh, the police officers arrested a girl at her prom. And since she was arrested in her prom dress, that's what we had to release her wearing because her parents didn't come down with like sweats or anything. So what what you come in jail with is what you're released in. Maybe he did have a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> he was coming yeah. from the party where, you know, he bragged everyone that he stole all the sure. money. And the next scene, the warden comes and tells Andy that there's a breakout at the neighboring prison, uh, Joliet prison. And one of them was Bruno, uh, Andy's partner that he um, ratted on. Uh, so now Dr. Alamo is recommending his release because Bruno is out there and he's going to gun him down as soon as he yeah, leaves and the jail. He broke out of his original prison the transfer to Springwood isn't going to happen. So Alamo's plan is just out the window, which really bums her out. Well, she's got a new plan. And I love her. Mm -hmm. The the, the scene where the next scene, they're letting him out and he's walking out and she's just there filing her nails. Like that's, that's the Penny Johnson. I love that. That's just like (laughs) manipulative. I'm just going to do my nails while I (laughs) have this whole calculated thing playing Mm -hmm. out. Well, it's interesting, too, that he doesn't really he's like, oh, I, you know, if he's out there, I should stay in here. I'm like, I don't know how many inmates would really not want to just press their luck and get out. Yeah. And move to another oh, country. Sure. He's like, no, yeah. I want to stay in jail. I'm like, really? <laughs> You're the only one who wants to do that. <laughs> so during the, the second attempt of his release, the warden opens the his cell. And this time Andy's wearing this like disheveled suit probably what he came in from his court trial and he gets into a cab and the and the driver is actually the uh 
the guard that he shot in the armored truck and Bruno is in the back seat and he strangles Andy, but um, it's all a dream. Well, and it's her dad. Yeah, her dad. It's her dad. And oh, that's the first hole. big. I didn't even put that together that that was her dad in the driver's oh, seat. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm, uh, the assumption yeah. I made. Mm-hmm. No, that makes she perfect sense. She tells him sense. earlier that it was her father, and that's kind of like her whole motive, why she's interested in him and why she was setting up Bruno to come or to be transferred to Springwood. So then mm-hmm. for real this time, the warden lets Andy out of his cell <laughs> just to go and be free in the world. And as they're walking down the, the hallway, um, Tuco tells the warden about the hidden money that Andy has. Andy is walking down the hallway. He sees Alamo and he decides to take matters into his own hands and he runs up to her and kills her with a homemade shiv. They didn't really do a big close up on it, so I couldn't tell what it was supposed to be, but it looked like. It, it sort of looked like a letter opener in a way. It was definitely just something metal. He and stabs metal. her in the gut and she bleeds out and dies. And now he has uh, another murder charge on his hands and he's not leaving for quite some time. I mean, it just seems crazy to me. I mean, I when I was watching it, I thought there are so many other ways he could have stayed in prison without another murder charge. He could have probably just rubbed <laughs> yeah. on an inmate. Oh, but yeah. instead, you know, he's... <laughs> goes for that's, it I guess. that's a question yeah. i have for all you guys is you know to me always the the best anthology series going back to ec comics and creep show and all that um there are always morality tales of some sort so someone commits a sin or a crime and they have to mm-hmm. pay for it um so the character of alamo i mean she basically is she has an ulterior motive you know she's trying to avenge her father's death um so she doesn't always abide by you know the rule of law so is, is do you think this is a form of like not that she deserved it but she was paying for her own transgression um do you see that as part of it or i wasn't sure as a viewer what i was supposed to feel when he killed her you know (laughs) i mean she definitely had a conflict of interest and Mm -hmm. was um, not following professional ethics i I think that that's a really interesting thought and and i you know i i say warily like i think that's interesting but did they think that do you know what i mean like i think that is an interesting road to go down and i wonder if that's actually what they were going for i I, I guess because i will jumping ahead but you know tying into the end of the the very end of the episode it does sort of have a thematic relevance to that as well and i mean look think of freddie i mean he's he's I'd say the word victim, but he was a victim of vigilante justice. That's how he became Freddy. So there definitely has been a theme throughout Nightmare on Elm Street, a little bit of uh, of all of that, you know. Um, of, you know, when do you follow law, when do you don't, what are the repercussions of, of that? Um, so it seems to be a recurring theme in Nightmare on Elm Street. Again, I'm probably overreaching quite yeah, a bit. I think but, for the first yeah, half, it's yeah. very revenge-driven. Alamo was just kind of a plot device, her, her motivation was. Um, mm-hmm. In the second half, I feel that it's more about selfishness and how to get ahead. Power. And yes, like true. Yeah. But speaking true. of Freddy, we have the interstitial, which I found <laughs> very bizarre, where he basically like tells his quote unquote <laughs> cellmate to get the soap <laughs> or drop the soap or yeah. something. And yeah. That's definitely very in line with, you know, later Freddy. Before Kruger. we get to that part, we... We find out from the warden, he tells Andy that he pretty much messed up big time, that Bruno was recaptured last night. So there was no reason for him to get another charge because since Bruno was captured, he would have been safe on the outside. But lo and behold, Bruno was brought to Springwood Prison and put (laughs) in Andy's cell to basically beat him with an inch of his life, um, but not for him to die. The warden tells the guard not to let Bruno kill Andy because uh, the warden wants information out of Andy. But And then we have uh, Freddy introduces us to his cellmate. And he, I mean, it looked like he sodomizes him with the glove. Yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's definitely, I think, mm-hmm. what they went for, which mm-hmm. is weird, maybe. Well, not for Freddy. Word? I mean, Freddy is a, originally is a child molester, so... Yeah, that's it's, true. It it seemed, and the interesting. I wonder who I'd love to. I need to look up who that actor was who did that little. Yeah, I don't remember know. or something. But yeah. just the look on <laughs> his face the whole time, and then he like just bends over. It was all very. I can see why. If this aired at 5 p.m. in the Bible Belt, maybe maybe <laughs> isn't really going to work on top of all the other things. Yeah, that shown but in I tell you, series. you know, growing up then, like Freddie had this weird. Like on one hand, he was almost like this cute bobblehead 
funny character with the garish lighting. He was hosting MTV, you know, video mm-hmm. hours. And he was also this deranged child murderer. But as a kid, that incongruence, he didn't seem weird. Like, he became like James Bond or like, you know, any young men of horror, kind of like you. Like, he could do these sick, horrible things, right? Because he was, at that point, he was such a caricature. It just didn't. It didn't seem offensive. It didn't seem to bother mm-hmm. people. It no, I mean, it, it was, a, it became cartoonish and he yeah. really did, he really did personify the anti-hero where mm-hmm. you really were. I mean, I know a lot of people watched Friday the 13th because they love Jason, but people were really watching A Nightmare on Elm Street a lot of mm-hmm. the times just to watch Freddy yeah. <clears throat> crack wise or yeah. something. He's like the Crypt Keeper at that point. No, it's yeah. easier yeah. to find the Crypt Keeper adorable because we don't know his past if he was a child molester or anything. So mm-hmm. I yes. like to say that um, that Freddy wasn't a child molester, that that part of him is not canon because it wasn't in the original Elm Street. Um, but that's just so I'm able to sleep at night because I don't, I don't want to root for a child <laughs> yeah. molester. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember even before that really became a thing about his character, that people were saying child mm-hmm. molester. Well, because you watch the first Nightmare and the way he taunts everyone. I mean, he's, just, he's very sexual, you know, like when he's like, come to Freddy and flicks his tongue. And I mean, mm-hmm. he's behaving. He seems like a pedophile, just the way he acts. He's not just enjoying the killing. He's enjoying sexually taunting the girl, I feel. Well, well, yeah, and you look at even Freddy versus Jason, he's licking the back of the picture mm-hmm. with this yeah. hot, awful glee. It's just terrible. Yeah. So, I mean, he really did bring those kinds of things to the forefront. I mean, he was always, you know, touching, you know, Amanda in her dream. He was on top of mm-hmm. her in her dream. He was mm-hmm. flicking his tongue at Nancy. You know, yes, he, he lifts his shirt up, but you're seeing his dirty, grimy body. It was all, mm-hmm. it was all very, like, in a way. Well, he takes kids back to a boiler room. I mean, you know, yeah. He didn't just go into people's kids' beds and kill them and leave. Like, he took them back to a dark secret place. A dark secret place. place. Yeah. And most serial killers have a sexual component. You know, from one from Buffalo Bill to Ed Gein to uh, Ted Bundy. I mean, there's always historically a sexual component to is, serial killers. Is Freddy so. the only slasher killer from the 80s and 90s that put a sexual connotation on it? Like, Jason wasn't sexual. Michael wasn't sexual. Chucky. Hellraiser definitely was. Yeah. Yes. Was yes. Oh yeah. I oh, mean, one could argue supernatural. That, yeah. One could argue that Jason, in a sense, is sexual only because as the franchise went on, it was like have sex, yeah. you know they're gonna well, die. But it didn't start out like that. Well, a lot of people forget like Halloween. So John Carpenter said this very explicitly that his whole psychology for Michael Myers was that he'd witnessed his sister have sex with the boyfriend upstairs and then killed her, and he was reliving that psychosexual moment over and over again so he would just stalk mm-hmm. mostly women and kill them because he's reliving that same and psycho definitely is sexual so I, I would argue that michael isn't overly sexual in the sense that he doesn't talk and it doesn't go as far as rape but um there is a sexual frisson to the whole mm-hmm. thing there's always some sort of psychosexual drama even jason he was he died because two kids were mm-hmm. having sex and didn't mm-hmm. see him there's always some sort of and certainly again certainly psycho i mean you know well, and even That's if you look day. at Texas Chainsaw, look at, mm-hmm. I mean, really part two, he thrust yes. the chainsaw oh, yeah. at her oh, with yeah. his pelvis. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of intertwining of sex and death and violence in all of these movies. Yeah. And I think you have to look a little deeper on some levels, but some it's right there. Dave, do you want to take us into the second half of this episode? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so Top we go that, from... Dave. Right. <laughs> We go from prison rape to yes. uh, the paid political <laughs> announcement. Um, yeah. Apparently, Warden Handler is running against uh, a woman named Sheila Reinfield for sheriff. And so we're in a, a Reinfield campaign commercial, and um, they're saying that the Andy's in it, and he's eating caviar, and the warden's in an electric chair. And so it's sort of this nightmarish campaign commercial vilifying uh warden handler and then he he wakes up and he's he is hurting in the election he's he's trailing by 20 points right now you know let me ask i I don't recall exactly was that like kind of political ad was that real or was that a dream that was a dream i thought was it a dream i i thought that was real he's doing a piece yeah that's okay i thought that it seemed real but he's like doing a political ad from an electric chair with hors d'oeuvres yeah or something yeah 
It was the night. It was the nineties, though. Do you know where that stuff? Well, did, did the prisoner did Andy have to sign a consent form in order to be in that commercial, and did he get paid for it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, I didn't really understand that part because it it felt dreamlike because it was like that extreme close up, and he's in the electric chair and he's yeah. eating. But I think it was real. See, I I thought it was a dream. Yeah, that's how I took it. it but I mean, it must be because it's her commercial. Mm -hmm. not yeah. His. yeah, exactly. I mean, oh, yeah. And he does. Uh, no, well, yeah. no, because it turned. I'm, I, I'm sort of slightly confused. Yeah. I got confused at this point in the show, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the show is too smart. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that Tuco from Breaking Bad is now up for release. So he is being released from the jail and he's asking Andy where the money is. But Andy won't tell him. So then the warden offers to talk to the parole board on Andy's behalf to get him out in like five years. And in return, the warden wants the, the money and he wants to know where the money is hidden. And this is his new campaign strategy to win over the hearts of Springwood constituents to vote for him. This is interesting because I don't know when Shawshank Redemption was written. I know the movie came out in 94, but there's shades of Shawshank with the corrupt prison, you know, guard, warden, everything like that, you know. Um, so I, was I am so glad you brought that, that up. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna say it earlier, and I was like, if I say that, they're gonna think no. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I said for you, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, because it's you know, this is ninety, so it's possible. Yeah, I don't know when. Uh, I know it was, it was a part of um, different seasons. This season it had a pupil, Shawshank Redemption, and. Couple other stories, and I just don't know when that was published. If that was published before this episode or not, I know the movie. I thought that was an. I thought that was a late eighties because wasn't Shawshank yeah. filmed like around ninety two or ninety? Yeah, it came out in ninety four. It was filmed it around that. Yeah, yeah, it came out ninety four. I only remember that because I was living in Indiana, and a friend called me up to talk about how her friend was working on a movie called Shawshank Redemption, and I just mm -hmm. remember vividly it being nineteen ninety three, and I'm like thinking back, that's yeah. when they must have filmed it. But I'm. I thought I remembered. Getting that book of stories, maybe later. Yeah, it, it could have been uh, earlier. Yeah, I know different different I, seasons is the name of the book. That's a part yeah, of I just looked stories. it up. Uh, different seasons was eighty two. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, it had been around for a long time. So it's. But I completely agree. I absolutely like look at this and I see kind of those Shawshanky type things, but it might just be because Shawshank Redemption is such a part of you know our yeah. culture now, but also. <laughs> Just some of the shots, like with the warden standing and the lot, it's like the wide, long shot of him yeah. at the end walking down the prison aisle. It just kind of, yeah. And there's probably well, not a lot you can do when you're filming well, in a prison. Yeah. So maybe that's what but it was. Also, the whole thing with the warden using the patient, you know, I can Shawshank it. You know, he, he knows Andy's innocent, but he makes him do all these things because he know, you know, so he's using this because he can hold and, it over him. Yeah. So yeah. you know what? This is interesting, Michelle. Let's do another one of our sidebars. Sure. As you've obviously realized that Peter and I are going to do. <laughs> when you were in this world, like my feeling is in movies and television and in books, the warden often is a terrible mm -hmm. person. I mean, are prison wardens in general terrible people who are they're always like corrupt. really yeah. have these machinations and these political like things that they use these inmates for? I mean, or yeah. are there wardens who are actually like, listen, if I can make a difference, I will, but they're always portrayed mm -hmm. as yes. having an I, I worked under mm -hmm. two wardens and both I thought really not that they wanted to make a difference because there's so much paperwork and, and red tape that they have to go through. They definitely did not have as much interaction with the inmates as it is shown in TV shows and movies. Mostly they were just there to make sure that all the funding and grants were allocated to the right sections and, and departments. So they were more about money than making a difference in lives. Um, the, the difference mm -hmm. um, in trying to make them a better person fell on the shoulders of like the case managers in that, in that unit. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the wardens, they were just money motivated um, mm -hmm. to make sure that the recidivism rate went down because... Yeah, I always thought the analogy was like, you know, when you go to school and principal versus mm -hmm. teachers, like you don't really see your principal very often. They don't teach, um, you know. It's very rare that you actually go to the principal's office. Like well, yeah, I mean, even when office. I was in high school, when we got in trouble, we saw the yeah. dean of students. Yeah, right. See the principal. If you yeah. saw the principal, mm -hmm. like particularly in high school, something was really <laughs> off. Yeah. 
because this is, yeah, you, you, like, you, you, yeah, you saw your guidance they're going to kick you out. So we meet uh, the doctor, Dr. Red, um, who is the science teacher from Gremlins. Yes, yes. Roy Hansen. Yeah. The, the warden asks him about this new drug that he's working on, uh, DRF4, which is a truth serum. And it will um, open up the brain to any suggestion. Uh, so the warden offers him a prisoner for testing. Which I think, and, you know, this is this half of the episode, I think, delves more into what a lot of the other sort of interesting shows delve into, which is doing these kind of things that become a real problem. I mean, obviously, this is going to induce more nightmares experimentation and never really goes right in these kinds of shows so i feel that this half of the episode tends toward the more obvious freddy's nightmares than the Mm -hmm. first half yeah which felt more like a drama with a few i mean they were nightmares but at the same time they didn't feel driven by anything other than what someone would naturally be having a nightmare of if he's gonna be worried about the electric chair he's gonna have a dream of the electric chair um i feel like side of the episode is a little more interesting because of the experimentation i just think it's also you know watching a lot of the freddy's nightmares episodes my personal feeling is I think a lot of them would have been better off being a half hour instead of an hour. Like this one, you could just do the second half. You don't really even the first half that much. I mean, it could be a much more compact, effective episode if you just did the last half of it. But I guess they had to fill a whole hour. But I don't know how you guys feel. Some of it felt like padding to me. I think that I think that the episodes could have been half as long mm-hmm. and maybe twice as good. I mean, you look at episodes of, say, Tales from the Crypt. I mean, I know they had a little more time because they were on HBO, mm-hmm. but they were an hour long. Were they? No, I don't think so. And that's probably like someone back and forth between half hour and an hour. I know like Monsters and Tales from the Dark Side, I think were half hour shows. Um, yeah. But we'll get to it later, but just the twist or the big surprise yeah, at the very end of this episode to me, after the whole hour, it just didn't really land because you're like, that's it? After I spent a whole hour on this <laughs> plot and that's all you get. Like, whereas for the half yeah. hour, you'd be like, oh, that's a fun one. Because it's really hard. After an hour, you expect a bigger, I personally expected a bigger payoff. So this, this, this but, drug, DRF4, it it's a truth serum in a way that it causes you to hallucinate whatever the person is telling you. So if they tell you that you are on a beach enjoying a margarita, that's what you're going to think that you're doing. And that's, that's your new truth, I guess. So the warden is going to use this to his advantage by giving it to Andy and then basically tricking Andy into telling the warden where he hid the money. And his plan is to go to the police where the where the money is since they haven't been able to find it in seven plus years and that will give him the points needed for the citizens of Springwood to love him again. When he's with the doctor, Andy is like strapped in the this like gurney bed thing and he's hooked up to all these IVs and the warden tells Andy that this drug is for an experimental cancer treatment and for doing this, for agreeing to be the guinea pig, he will get out in five years. And I again, the, the nasty warden doing what he needs to do. I just love that this, like, if I invented a true serum, like, you'd think he'd go to, like, multi-million dollar drug companies. He wouldn't be, like, testing it out in Springwood. Prison yeah, somewhere. like, go to Pfizer <laughs> or something. <right>? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is I feel like, I have a lot of thoughts. I think it's just too plotty, but it's like, there's so many things that, He could have probably made a deal for an even lesser sentence if he would have just given up the location of the money. This whole money thing is as a driver is is just I think it's not the strongest because it's like you're going to go through all of these and potentially like murder inmates. Like, again, the doctor coming up is like, I'm I'm, I took an oath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, to help people. I'm like, yeah. well, then you shouldn't have probably devised this drug, which you knew. Well, was I was say, yeah, he's performing mm-hmm. a illegal, uh, illegal clinical trial without any protocols. I mean, he kind of violated his Hippocratic oath at this point already. Like, so way before, way before. Yeah, that yeah. But also, this is all about, just about winning an election. He doesn't even want yeah. the money for himself. Yeah. yeah. But the um, other thing is, okay, I'm sorry. Let's he, let's just keep going down this rabbit hole. <laughs> he's not even like trying to be governor. He's not. He's just not yeah. trying to be a senator mm-hmm. or. He's just trying to be the chief of police, the, yeah, right? The sheriff. I mean, the sheriff. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. The sheriff of Springwood. Like, I mean, yeah. that's what you're going to murder people to do. <laughs> it's like, if you're going to murder someone, it should be big. It should be real. Like, I mean, what, what, how much, how much is he gaining by what he's losing? I just, I never really got that. I, I thought he should have been trying to do something yeah. that would ultimately that's give him much more power. I mean, essentially, instead of being, He's the sheriff inside this building, so he wants to be the sheriff outside the mm-hmm. building now, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I thought that a missed opportunity for the episode was 
um, her name was, was um, um, mm-hmm. Alamo, correct? From earlier on? Mm-hmm. Um, if she would have lived and she would have been the one working with the doctor with the truth serum because she's trying to get him to tell the truth for, for you know for her father some sort of emotional reason why you would do something like this i think that might, might be a much more compelling storyline than just this warden who wants to be police chief well i thought that actually she was going to come back and she yeah. was going to end up with the money yeah or something oh, and that's what so i thought much better. Like, yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. just something to tie but to tie like part like because i know part two is tied into part one generally in this show with one of the lesser characters from the part one but they don't always bring back you know like a part one character to like round it out and i thought that would have been interesting like so he stabbed her kind of once and he maybe jiggled around a little but she could have lived yeah she was very interesting she, to me she's probably the most interesting character in the whole episode mm-hmm. so i was a little disappointed yeah. that she disappeared halfway through but i know at party snipers in general seems a little bifurcated in the sense a lot of episodes because again they're not how long i the first half and the second there's a very clear first and second mm-hmm. half but interesting a similar thing happened to her on 24 because she was uh her character was shot in the stomach and then i i saw an interview with the producer where he was like we intentionally shot her in the stomach so she can come back but she never did (laughs) so (laughs) it's like the same thing that's just the way she's meant to go out i guess Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> so I guess now we're in the, the sort of hypnotized drug state with Andy and he <laughs> uh, is in the cell and Bruno's there. Uh, but Bruno was really the warden. Um, and Bruno asks him where the money is. And he says, you know, I, I have a master key. I'm going to break us out. And Andy says, like, you have to take me with me. Yeah, you have to take me with you. And then I'll tell you where the money is. And then he, you know, that's his drug dream and he just sort of wakes up feeling sick yeah i mean again i feel like more could have possibly been done because it's again pretty straightforward i think that that's one of the problems with this episode for me is it's just so straightforward police kind of police slash prison drama (laughs) (laughs) i don't really know where's the horror saying every episode of the show was horror but there was a lot of episodes that even when they had like the underlying story that could easily not be horror. They still peppered in a lot of those elements. And here I still feel like the dreams are just not as horrific as maybe they could be. Maybe they could have pushed it a little farther. I really find this episode, and I've said it over and over, to just be really kind of dramatic. <laughs> well, essentially to me, there's not really a main character you can root for. I mean, Alamo's dead. Um, the prisoner the warden's I mean, awful. Yeah. The, the, even the doctor is, you know, unethical. And... Um, and then the prisoner, of course, is a murderer. So you kind of feel bad because he is being experimented on and lied to, but he's yeah. still a murderer. So there really isn't anyone to root for, so to speak. But, yeah, there's no real hero in this. Although, yeah. uh, something I wanted to bring up just because for all the theater geeks out there, Andy, um, you know, the guy who plays Andy, mm-hmm. was on Broadway. He was like a classically oh. trained dancer. He was with the American Ballet Theater. Oh. Oh. So you know what? Interesting. You can yeah. go from ballet to <laughs> <laughs> so when Andy comes to in his cell, the guard tells him that Bruno was actually electrocuted last night. Um, so Andy's like, but, you know, th- he doesn't understand how that's possible since he talked to him the night before about going to find mm-hmm. the money. So the next day when Andy is talking to the warden, the warden tells him that Bruno wasn't electrocuted as planned, that it got delayed for whatever reason. The doc or the warden wants to continue the treatment on Andy because he needs Andy to believe that they are going to wherever the money is buried that night. But the doctor is having reservations about doing it because of how sick Andy is getting from the drug as a side effect. But the warden doesn't really care, and he's like, just do it. And he kind of blackmails the doctor into doing it. Like, well, I'll just tell people that you did it anyway. So the doctor's like, whatever, and gives him the the IV shot thing. And now we're into his second hallucination. Which I think is where it starts to really hit home that there, like we just talked about, there aren't any redeeming no. people <laughs> in this one at all. I mean, they're all just a part of this awful plan that really is only going to benefit the mm-hmm. warden. I mean, at the end of the day, if the doctor is going to be doing this and risking everything he's worked his whole life toward, he should at least say, I want something. Like, yeah. I mean, if you're going to have that kind yeah. of character, I don't necessarily feel bad enough for him where I'm like, oh, poor doctor. It would have made more sense for the doctor to go, listen, if I'm going to do this, you have to make it worth my while. Yeah. Which I think would have added maybe more plot. Yeah. Well, but, I think about it. I mm-hmm. mean, um, Andy's the person who has the most leverage in the situation because he knows where the money is. So 
he should be the one setting the terms. But so during the second bright. hallucination, and I kind of liked it just the way that it was set up. Um, the warden is posing as Bruno, but because the doctor kind of um, fiddled with whatever the drug solution is, he kind of fiddled with it to where he wasn't getting enough of the dosage to fully put him under this hallucination. The warden is trying to impose Bruno, but in Andy's mind, like Bruno and the warden keep fading in and out to one another. It's the warden's face, but Bruno's voice or quite the opposite. So he's fading in and out of this hallucination as the warden slash Bruno is trying to get him to think that they are going to the secret money location. And I thought, I thought that was kind of well done just out of camera work and the whole like changing of costumes and stuff. No, I liked it too. And I feel like that's why in this part of the episode, I feel like it's a little more interesting. I mean, they're trying to do things that make the viewer engage, but also play really well into the story. And yeah, it was visually, it was neat. And it worked and it helped mm-hmm. propel what was going on. And it's going to lead us to, you know, one of the next moments where the warden is really going to go a little yeah. nutso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they try to up the dosage and the, the doctor unplugs the IV because it's going to kill him. And Andy ends up having a heart attack and he's dying. And as he's dying, he tells the warden where the money is. It's in a, a box at Springwood Bank. I, I think I love the moment where the warden ups the dosage as like a complete crazy man <laughs> right. like he's like pushing on the IV like he, he's like doing whatever you do with an IV and it's just like he, he's completely lost his marbles at that moment and I don't know why Andy gives up at this point the location of the money is it because he's the drug is still in his system oh no they, guess, they had right? like a very brief conversation that if he told the warden where the money is that that might save him and kind of like either have him go to heaven or he'll be forgiven for all his other crimes yeah, there's a lot going yeah. on. <laughs> uh, there is a lot going on. I got lost for a second. I love how it all comes back to Springwood mm-hmm. Bank. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. well, it's funny because normally, you know, a crime like this, they could put subpoena the records at Springwood Bank and, and found out the money was Somewhere there years deposited. ago. Yeah, they oh, are not better, deposited, but yeah. I don't know. Do you? I'm not sure. I'm not well versed on safety. I'm assuming he means like a safety mm-hmm. deposit box. Yeah. But how do you put that much money into a safety deposit yeah, box? That's I mean, a big they got box. away with an armored yeah. car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. one of the, the really big that's boxes on the bottom. Made more sense. Am, yes. I not, yeah. am I asking the wrong question? <laughs> no. Yeah. There are no wrong questions here. <laughs> yeah. No. So Andy has now died, and the warden knows exactly where the money is, and the doctor is feeling very remorseful and regrets his involvement in what happened. So in the next scene, we see that the warden has strapped the doctor onto the same gurney and is using the little tabulator clear thing on him to like make him also have a heart attack. But it turns out that it's just a dream. But because of that dream, the doctor comes up with his own plan to get back at the warden. So much going on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so much double crossing. <laughs> Triple crossing. <laughs> um, so now we're, they're doing a live interview in the prison that afternoon um, because the, the money's been recovered. So it's this sort of, you know, celebratory press interview that's, you know, going to put him ahead in the polls. Um, but as he's getting ready uh, for the interview, uh, the doctor walks in and slips something into the warden's water. So, oh, and he said, I have in my notes the amount. So that armored truck robbery, they, it was $5 million. Uh, yeah, you can't put $5 million dollars yeah. in the yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, Maybe um, Springwood Bank would be... Well, Springwood Bank, yeah. anything can happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. I think what's interesting is the like press conference or whatever, where the drug that was slipped into his water causes him to have hallucinations. Mm-hmm. And... And he has the hallucination of the um, doctor. The correct? doctor turns into Andy during the hallucination. So is the doctor really mm-hmm. there? Yes. Okay, this is what I have a question about. <laughs> <laughs> this this doctor is sneaking behind them on an a- on camera <laughs> press conference, and he's crouched down, and the woman interviewer looks at him. No one thinks this is out of the ordinary. <laughs> well, maybe she was in on it. Maybe he told her ahead of time he's going to do this so she can get her Oh, scoop. yeah. Maybe, because I know that at one point <laughs> she kind of like tells the camera people, like, get this guy. Yeah, yeah. keep going, keep going. 
But yeah. I mean, I thought I thought for a second there that he wasn't really Yeah, no, there. he was he was definitely there. Yeah. He was the doctor was definitely there, yeah. but he was trying to come across as he was Andy talking to the warden and as Andy he was prompting the warden to confess to the experimental drug treatment and how he really found the money and why. Well, then I would not vote for him as sheriff. He can't even keep the press conference safe. <laughs> yeah, right. from so the, the warden basically confesses to everything on air. Um, he, he confesses to the experimental drug treatment and killing Andy. And um, then the episode cuts to Freddie, and Freddie gives us a political message of finally a politician tells the truth. The truth. Uh-huh. Very topical. Yeah, that's it's true. Topical. That's mm-hmm. one thing. <laughs> yeah. fake news. That was yeah. that. So not only is that the end of the episode, it's the end of Freddie's nightmares. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing for me is I, I wanted more payoff after mm-hmm. an hour. Like, that's a cute little yeah. twist for, like, a 20-minute, you know, again, anthology episode after an hour. It's kind of like, that's it. But what did maybe you I'm think re- overall of Freddy's Nightmares? I, I think it's a cool idea to have an anthology show with Freddy. I just wish they would have tied in Freddy mm-hmm. more. Because what do I feel like a lot of times his quips or his little, inter- his little interstitials, you could take those out and you wouldn't lose anything. Um, and, again, like, the dream, like, in this, you took out the dream sequences and really wouldn't make a difference. They feel very superfluous. Like, we need a dream sequence every few minutes, so we'll just toss one in the episode. I feel like if they streamlined to a half hour and really targeted the themes of the episodes more to Springwood and dreams and connected it more, it could have been a really awesome show. So as it is, there's, like, moments I'd like mm-hmm. in episodes. But as a whole, the show didn't fully exploit in a good way, like, the premise of a Freddy Krueger anthology show. So that's mm-hmm. my overall feel. But there were some good moments here and there, you know, in certain episodes and and plus, it's just batshit crazy to me that, sorry if I swear, that, um, I mean, they let, like, they gave them all this money to do a show, from what I understand. I, Tommy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there really wasn't a lot of oversight. So they could do whatever directors and writers could do whatever crazy things they wanted. So it's kind of cool that for like two years and 44 episodes, mm-hmm. people were allowed to do yeah. a show. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, they were given kind of freedom, and, you know, it was syndicated. So that also kind of gave you a little more freedom. Yeah. What killed it was, as everyone, most people know, was, was the time slot. But what was interesting was it wasn't on at the 5 p.m. kind of dinner time hour everywhere. When I was a kid, this show was on at night. Yeah. Like 11 p.m., it. somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah it was too, late. Yeah. And I remember having to, you know, pop in the VCR VHS tape for the kids out there. That's this <laughs> big machine that you could record onto <laughs> tape um, <laughs> to watch the episodes later. And... Um, it's just my feeling is I think I have seen every episode and I rewatched them when we did the documentary and I've been, you know, parsing through some of them here and there just, you know, to watch the ones with say Mariska Hargitay or Brad Pitt, you know, just for mm-hmm. fun. But I, I never enjoyed the series. If I'm being completely honest, yeah. it wasn't a show that I, I was like, Ooh, Freddie's nightmares is yeah. on. Honestly, I watched it because I got, you know, cause mm-hmm. it had Freddie. Yeah. In those little tiny mm-hmm. moments, I mean, that really, for me as a younger kid, was the draw. I didn't understand some episodes when I saw them at first. Like again, some of them were so dramatic. I was like, "What is this?" The fast there's forward, some that, there's like, some get to the blood. Yeah. There's some that you still don't ever understand. I think. Right? Yeah, I mean, in this yeah. episode, how many questions <laughs> did I have? What What was your um, overall feeling on this episode in particular? I again, I feel that it was just so plotty and drama heavy. And I don't think the nightmares played into the Elm Street universe yeah. in a way that some of the other things in the episodes did. I feel the nightmares were incredibly organic to what the character would have dreamed, whether Freddy existed, whether Springwood existed or not. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I, there was always this feeling in many other episodes that even if Freddy wasn't omnipresent, that he was still sort of, you know, the idea was he was pulling the, the strings. He was the puppet mm-hmm. master here. I never felt Freddie's presence in this episode unless it was one of those little interstitial moments. Mm-hmm. And frankly, talk about wanting a bigger payoff. I think as the end to the series, this is a oh, letdown. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to assume that they, they didn't think this was the last, like this wasn't supposed to be the series finale. They just hoped they would get renewed, right? Like they weren't, this wasn't like meant to end the whole series they just got canceled right? no no this was not like hey this is our idea yeah, for a exactly. series finale <laughs> yeah yeah no as a matter of fact i'm pretty sure roberts talked about this in given interviews where they believed that they were going to end up being able to do more potentially with you know better resources and 
because their ratings were good. So I think it was everything else that killed them. And I think that this all happened really fast. I don't know the timing, but I I think it was a case of we could still be going on and, oh, we're Mm -hmm. shut down. Also, too, this was peak Freddy over. It came out all my more mainstream friends after Nightmare 4. They were just kind of over. Like, Nightmare 4 was a peak. Everyone saw it. MTV movie. And then by 90, I know everyone was like getting sick of Freddy. Same with Jason. It just kind of run its course. So, well, and you um, look at part five, you know, again, you had part four, which was a huge success. Mm -hmm. And then you had the series, which was, you know, successful in the way it needed to be successful. But it was starting that, like you said, overexposure. I mean, now he's every week on television. Yeah. And then you look at part five, you would think that the box office would have been at or greater to, say, the biggest entry in the franchise at that time. And it wasn't. Yeah. No. Um, And I don't think one could necessarily say it was an inferior movie, whether one believed that or not. Yeah. You would think that the fans would have come out in droves once again to see his exploits after that hugely successful part four. But they just kind of like I think that it it started to get tiring for people. Yes, I remember like part four, like a lot of my friends that were like more casual horror fans, like, oh, this Nightmare on Street thing's really big. We should go see it. Part four was the one that everyone saw. So I think the hardcore fan base was always there. And it showed up for five, but all the mainstream people that started to come in with four, like four was it for them. You know, they left. Same with Friday the 13th. You know, it started to go downhill and it was just catering to the hardcore fan base. Um, but um, I mean, you look at, you know, two weeks apart, it was night, Friday the 13th, part eight, Jason takes Manhattan. I think two weeks later was. Nightmare Five, and then literally um, a month or two later was uh, Halloween Five, which also underperformed. So I mean, all three of the franchises just people are just over them. Nineteen eighty nine was not a good year for slasher franchises. <laughs> no, I so. remember Fangoria ran in um, one of the editorials. Um, I'm pretty sure back, you know, back then it was Tony Timponi. Um, yeah. Where he the I loved this phrase, and I always remembered. I I may be misquoting it a tad bit, but it was basically. The Muppets did a better job of taking Manhattan yeah. and Freddie failed <laughs> and Freddie failed to rob the box office cradle. And I thought that phrasing <laughs> as, you know, someone who grew up wanting to be a writer just always stuck with me because it was such great imagery in a way mm-hmm. playing off of these other movies that were more successful. But it really was like you said, mm-hmm. Peter, it was a time when horror was just not it was everywhere, but it, it was kind of nowhere yeah. in a way. Like you could go out and see all of this horror, but no one was doing it. Yeah, people got sick. I mean, it was too much. Like you know, um, everything. That's how it always, ha- it always happens. Whether it's like a popular band or a movie series, you always do that one too many. You, 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 you never know you've reached your peak until the one that makes less than the one before. So mm-hmm. it just and that was just part five. But that was for Nightmare. It was five. Mm-hmm. Halloween was five. For Jason, it was eight. It was just funny. It all happened in that same three or more four month period. All these you know, slasher franchises came out. And you saw, like, you know, it, you. That that's interesting. I'm I'm really sidebarring here in a way, but it makes me wonder if like that year or two or whatever, like <laughs> did the fans who made these franchises what they were and you know become the successes, did the fans age out in a way, whether they were the younger kids who aged out or whether they were the adults? Like I wonder I wonder if that part of like the demographic is also one of the reasons like you know at some point you just decide i don't want to watch x anymore or i'm busy because now i have kids or whatever i wonder maybe if it would be interesting to to, if there was a way to go back and look at demographics of let's say the nightmare franchise like one through four those demographics did in some way other than the franchise becoming tired did those people in a way age out of deciding i must go see this movie right away and the same thing with the friday the 13th franchise it would just I just, I don't know. Just yeah, makes I think, me think, I think about you know, it. Yeah, I don't think there was any like huge dem- specific gram- demographic shift. Like all of a sudden, you know, women didn't show up or African Americans didn't show up. Um, it was just across the board. It's just, I don't know, it's that peak thing. Like, you know, it just happens. Like, you, you just, people start getting sick of something. Like, look at Fast and the Furious. I mean, it's been going for a long time. But I think the, finally this last one that came out was the first one that had done less than the last three previous ones. Like, you can't keep going up and up eventually there's gonna be a point where people i think people do age out of it even i remember like 89 i was getting older and getting ready to go to college and it was like you kind of have that feeling like you know i think once especially after college these feel movies to me i could be totally wrong feel kind of more high school age movies you know and once you're older like if i was 30 in 1989 i don't think i would be going to see halloween five i could be wrong but 
you know, because it's about younger kids and teenager stuff. Um, and that to me seems more like the high school age. And uh, yeah, once you're off to college, you start having kids of your own families. People usually tune out. Well, yeah, stuff. that's what I that's what I was wondering too. If that wasn't just that, you know, the the attrition effect maybe has yeah. something to do with yeah. that kind of thing. And just you know, I'm thinking more and more. I I'm actually um I have part of the episode paused and I'm looking at the like the set, I you know, at the, over the under the end credits and a, a big problem I think with the show was the fact that particularly obviously this season they cut the budget and I think that uh, was always a problem. I think season one looked a little better. Obviously it pushed the envelope a little more, but then they got the complaint, so they pulled the money back because I think they were like, let's tone down the content and see how far we can go. But even that wasn't enough. And even though the ratings were still yeah. good enough, I think. You know, well, it's also, um, they just yeah, had to cancel. Interesting to contrast Friday's Nightmares with Friday the 13th, the series, which I know had nothing to do with Jason, but you know, they went the thing of having reoccurring characters. So it was like a, it was like a monster of the week, but it had the same three core characters that went episode to episode. It was interesting if Freddy's Nightmares had followed, it still could have been Freddy and, and Springwood, but if it followed the same characters and didn't do the sort of, because the theology thing, like there's never reoccurring characters, so you're always at that mercy of, well, that episode was good. That one sucked. And, you know, it's very hit or miss and spotty. It didn't have a through line to it. I don't know if that, you know, made it better or worse. I don't know. Well, Peter, do you have anything that you would like to um, promote or talk about that's um, going on in, in your life before we let you guys go? <laughs> Not too much. I, I, I hope to have a new book out next year. It hasn't been announced yet, but if you're a fan of the 90s, Slasher movies, you'll, you'll enjoy it. So. Is it part of a series, or do you have others? Uh, it's like I'm looking at a whole era. So uh, films like Scream, I know last summer, that whole era of film. So it's not a single film series, but um, yeah. Hope, Tommy, hope is um, there anything on your shelf that's uh, coming out? No, right now I'm doing a lot of writing. I just turned in another novel to my publisher, mm. so that will be coming out in December. It's not horror so i'm kind of excited about that mm. it's it's sort of a fantasy with hints of darkness and that will be out in december and i am still writing the sequel to jinx <laughs> my first horror novel mm -hmm. which i'm really excited mm -hmm. about so yeah just keeping the home typewriter fires okay. burning you should write a, you should write a prison drama, <laughs> yeah, you should. Should write a prison drama. <laughs> i think i know everything i need to know yes <laughs> thank you guys so much for yeah. coming on here thank you guys thank you us. it was, yeah, it was a real pleasure it. what did you think of this episode we've been on this journey for 44 episodes now <laughs> how was it <laughs> as the surprising series finale uh well i mean as our guest said it wasn't much of a a um wasn't much of a series mm -hmm. finale um because it didn't really tie into the freddy stuff and was just sort of this you know prison story um honestly i just i i know i've said this multiple multiple times but i love penny johnson and and her playing that type of character mm -hmm. so that um lifted up the episode mm -hmm. for me but without <laughs> i would say she was the high point and and as, otherwise the episode kind of kind of dragged along and didn't have a great payoff what did you think um, i i liked it I, I i especially liked the first half of it because i you know i said this to tommy and peter and you earlier that my degree is in criminology and i worked in a prison so this was kind of like coming home <laughs> you know this was like my my ground to walk on <laughs> Um, I, so I really liked it from that point of view. I didn't care for the second half too much. I think you three like the, the experimental part more than the first half. So I'm, uh, alone on, on this one, but I liked the episode. Uh, it's not a good series finale, but like we talked about, we, they didn't know that it was going to be a series finale. Um, but yeah, I, I actually enjoyed it. This was one of the very few episodes where I wasn't like checking the time to be like, okay, when is it over? Is something exciting going to happen? I, I kind of was checking. Oh, were you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So overall, yeah. what did you think about the series? Little, little 11 year old Dave and 
or 12, 12, were you 12, <laughs> 12, 12 year old Dave in 1990. When it came out, um, <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't watch it when it aired. I think I, the first time I saw episodes was a few years later, like 93, 94. Um, but I think I appreciated, I appreciated it a lot more now than I did then, because then it was like, the movies are so great. And, and then here's this show that, you know, there's a clear difference in quality between the movies and the show. Um, but now I think watching it, I can appreciate it for what it was. Um, I thought the first season sort of felt more, I mean, I know the whole series took place in Springwood, but the first season felt more like Freddy-ish Springwood, like, you know, like I'm thinking of the episode of like the the kid having a house party and falling out the window. And there's the the one where the the guy wants to get out of the Springwood and he's drag racing. And it just sort of felt like, you know, it was all part of this universe. And this like season two, even though it took place in Springwood, it felt like it could have been anywhere like the, you know, the rich woman breaking people up in her basement and uh, the prison and the interior loft. It just sort of felt like other stories that just happened to have Freddie as the introducing and yeah. <laughs> wrapping them up. I noticed yeah. in the first season, it was geared more toward teenagers and, and their story. Um, what would they tend to go through, like being afraid of going to college and stuff like that. Um, and the second season was so overly sexualized and sexually driven that the, the all the characters were, were adults, you know, like there were, there were barely any episodes that were centered on teenagers and, and their fears. Um, so I'm not sure if that was done purposely because Freddy's Nightmares wanted to go into a more mature direction and because it was on so late at night they were trying to get the older demographic that's just flipping through the channels and like oh Freddy Krueger my son talks about him all the time let's see what this is you know sort of thing <laughs> right <laughs> but how do you how do you feel about it now versus then when you when it was originally um, on I think little 11 year old Michelle would have just been so happy to see Freddy every week that I wouldn't have really cared that the stories were kind of terrible. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm kind of glad that it's over because some of these episodes I was just, yeah, throughout our whole podcast, I kind of feel like I've been a, a Debbie Downer because I just, it's very clear that I did not enjoy the series or thought very highly of it. So I think now if it were to come on, it would definitely be better. And if it was facing cancellation from like ABC or whatever station it was on, I think Netflix or Hulu would definitely pick it up and make it more HBO type. I think if it came on now, Netflix would have been able to save it. It would look so much better. Like it would look movie quality oh, sure. if it were made today. Yeah, there's the set design, especially in the second season, you can tell that they were just in a corner of a sound stage and you know, like two walls were painted the color of the living room and that was it. <laughs> right. Know, put a couch there and um, you know, some little plant and call it a living room. <laughs> so how are you feeling with with the whole thing being over? I'm kind of sad because you know I've been a, a fan of, of Nightmare on Elm Street for so long, and there was always, you know, you know, I'll, from the beginning, I knew of the existence of Freddy's Nightmares, and I never r really got that into it. And, you know, I've had the DVDs forever, but this is my first time actually sitting and watching all mm -hmm. of them. So it's, you know, it's like the end of, you know, seeing Robert Englund as Freddy and, you know, in the prime of of you know the 80s and and when freddie was super popular and um so it's you know I'm sad that that's over and um you know and also it being an anthology series just sort of when i would watch them i would not look up anything beforehand i'd just sit down and watch it so it was always like fun to have a surprise of of what the episode was about what about you yeah it's it's bittersweet and I like being able to talk about Freddie and you know learning more about you as, as my friend and having this experience but also I'm so glad I never have to watch another episode <laughs> 
so glad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I liked I liked talking to all the guests that we had and um, mm-hmm. the cast and, and crew members that came on and talked to us. There's a convention I might be going to if the world ever goes back to normal. And Mick Strawn is going to be there. So I get to go up to him and say, hey, you oh. talked to us about Freddy's Nightmares, <laughs> you know. So stuff like that was, <laughs> was fun. But yeah, so it's, it's mm-hmm. bittersweet. I think more sweet than bitter, but. Yeah, it's been so great talking with you and in depth and about these shows. And yeah, it's been it's been really fun. And it's, yeah, it's been a fun mm-hmm. project watching them with an eye towards what are we going to talk about and what are we going to pick apart? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are, are so many times I would watch an episode and I would think, oh, I wonder how Dave is going to feel about this one. <laughs> <laughs> so okay yeah thank you to everyone who's listened shared and liked and thank you to our guests who joined us on the program so we had nick devon blake best ryan yohi mark estes hayden hall david anderson amanda gonzalez mark dubovec deandra laser tommy hudson and peter Brackey. And also thank you so much to the the cast and crew members who um, joined us on the program and, and talked to us about their experiences with the show. Diane Franklin, Mick Strawn, Dean Denton, Lisa Fuller, Clayton Landy, and Tiffany Helm. And among those listeners, we had over to the state over 4,000 downloads and listeners from the U.S., Ireland, Canada, Spain, France, U.K., Sweden. Finland, Russia, and Nepal. So thank you everyone from those countries for listening and letting us spend an hour with you. We really appreciate it.